and where did you meet uh, Elsa? 25 plus years ago, moved from New York to Cambridge, Massachusetts. And our young son, Hamilton, was four years old, something like that. And my wife took him to have his photograph taken by Elsa. And we've been friends ever since. And I would, I'm going to guess that perhaps <coughs> at some point, not just Hamilton, but yourself, uh, pose for a, a picture for Elsa. Like Absolutely. That. There's many, many in our home Elsa photographs. Photographs of our dogs, photographs of our son, my wife and me, my mother, my stepfather. Um, she took the photograph of Robert McNamara that appears on the poster of The Fog of War and on the DVD. Um, hmm, I didn't realize that. Oh, yeah. Wow. What is it like to... I was going to say sit for a photograph with her, but probably more likely stand stand for a photograph for her. Most likely stand for a photograph, although I think I've both sat and stood for Elsa photographs. Um, there's really nothing quite like it because to be photographed by Elsa is to be taken into Elsa's world. Um, you go down to the studio, there are Polaroid photographs on the walls. Um, many of the photographs of people that I know or knew. And Elsa's engaged in a relationship. It's always a relationship with Elsa. You're talking to Elsa. Um, she's arranging the camera. Now she needs several people to help her take a, a Polaroid. But in those days, she would operate the camera herself. And there's a whole kind of deal going down there, talking to Elsa, relating to Elsa, um, seeing her prepare the camera, um, and then the picture being taken and not knowing exactly when it's going to be taken, worried, is this going to be a good shot or a bad shot? Because it's not like someone taking a hundred photographs from a usual experience of someone taking multiple photographs. Um, she takes two, maybe three at most. If you feel that Elsa really likes you, she might take three, but usually two. And then you're given a choice. Uh, I don't know if it's a Sophie's choice kind of thing, but you're given a choice to pick one. And she keeps the one you don't pick, and you pay f for the one you want. It's a deal, a whole process. Um, How difficult is it to choose? It isn't all that difficult, but one of the great ironies of it all is she kept these B-side photographs, as she calls them, the rejects. She kept them in these flat files, and as time went on, you know, the archive of B-side photographs has expanded to a prodigious size. There's thousands of them. And Many of them are really terrific photographs in their own right. And in some of the instances where Elsa is able to make a comparison, the B-side photographs are better, clearly better. Why'd they pick that one? That wasn't so good. Well, I, so I'm wondering, do you feel like you picked the right one? Or, or perhaps only time will tell? 
But something about the passage of time. It's all about the passage of time. I realize that acutely through my friendship with Elsa and my knowledge of uh, her art. Um, the whole movie is about the passage of time. Uh, if anything, it's a kind of elegy, elegy for the passing of Polaroid, the passing of some of Elsa's closest friends. She says so many extraordinary things in the film that are totally unscripted. The, the photography of nailing down the now and the now chasing in front of. Um, she's effortlessly profound, which I find also interesting. She also doesn't try to look smart. I've spent a good part of my life trying to look smart. And Elsa achieves that. Um, it's actually quite amazing. The art is unassuming, seemingly unassuming. And yet it produces this amazing array of images. And perhaps because she's very unassuming and, and the art is unassuming, it, it seems like she really has been underappreciated and probably misunderstood as a, as a photographer for most of her career, if not all of her career. Uh, I think that's true. She's been the B-side uh, in her own life and her work. It's one of the joys of making the movie because it's saying to the world, saying to myself included, that this is a really gifted artist and incredible human being, and I'd like to see her celebrated. I would. There can be nothing as good as watching Elsa watching my movie. Uh, it's just... <laughs> such an immense pleasure to see the enjoyment that she gets out of watching the B-side. One of the things that I found most fascinating is her um, description of what she's attempting to get, if you will, as a photographer, and her saying it's about the surfaces. You know, uh, that was kind of shocking to me in the sense that, uh, I don't know, I guess it's just some, something you assume that the photographer is, you know, she contrasts that with trying to capture someone's soul. But there's something terribly revealing about the surfaces. She ca and, and something very wise about her approach, I think. I agree. Um, particularly because she takes so few photographs of each person. It's not like you have a contact sheet and you can take out your white marker and circle the ones you feel should be printed. There's a very limited universe of possibilities, most often two. And I remember telling her that I didn't like one of her photographs very early on. Glad she still s talks to us. And Elsa said, wait 10 years and look at it again. And of course, she's right. I've looked at photographs now over 10, 15, 20, 25 years. And each of them becomes more and more important over the years can't really completely explain it, but it's if those people in the photographs are still with us. She talks about that, and god damn it, it's true. Amazingly, it's actually true. You, of course, are, are known in many of your documentaries of using the Interatron 
Yes. Which is a really genius <clears throat> device, but that wasn't necessary here, I, I guess, because you know her so well. And you used it for my Netflix series, and I decided not to use it for the B side. I keep thinking what it would have been like to shoot with the Interatron. It would have been good, but it would have been very, very, very different. I like the idea when I was in the garage. The garage is very small. But people see the garage, and you think, oh my God, that's where you shot this thing. How do you cram uh, four or five cameras into such a small space? Uh, but we did. And it's me sitting on this counter. This runs the length of the room. Uh, I'm operating the A camera, which has a device on it called the Revolution. So I can turn the camera. I can dutch the camera, and that's something very new for me. It's actually, on the Interatron, I'm separated. I'm there just, I'm Mr. Potato Head, you know, looking into this teleprompter and trying to elicit a response. But I am divorced from the camera, completely divorced from the camera. Uh, here, I'm really operating the camera. I'm part of the whole process of making a film. So I liked it. It's participatory. I got involved. Um. And your work, uh, certainly in some of your writings, has, has examined photography and not so much the question of whether photographs tell the truth, but do the interpretations of photographs, are they accurate? Can they ever be accurate? Do, do Elsa's photographs tell the truth? Is that a kind of irrelevant standard? In, in consider photography? Well, I should write more about this because it's not been, I believe, well understood. Maybe it hasn't been well understood by me included. But truth for me is a linguistic notion. You ask yourself, is this sentence true um, uh, or false? It's not a question that Donald Trump would ask himself because everything for him is true regardless of anything anyone else might think. Um, is this sentence true? It's a linguistic idea. To me, to ask if a photograph is true makes no sense. Um, really makes no sense. You could put together various sentences about, is it true that that person really was standing in such and such a place when the photograph was taken? But I'm not sure I understand what it means to say a photograph is true or false. And this idea that if you obey certain rules that you can be guaranteed that the photograph is true strikes me as nonsense talk. It's this direct cinema idea, um, still very, very prevalent in documentary photography as well as in still photography and in journalism, that if you touch anything in a scene that it somehow is no longer uh, truthful. And I've tried to write about that whole issue Yeah, there is no truth in photography. In that respect, I agree completely with Elsa. Mm. An example, she often says, I point to contact shoots. Uh, 
we now treated the coffee table books of Diane Arbus's uh, contact sheets. And there's the boy with a grenade in Central Park. You see the whole array of photographs that she took. She picked one of them, which is a great photograph, but completely different from all the other photographs. And she was interested in showing something, um, something more truthful than those other images that were on the contact sheet. I don't know what that really means. Um, but she was involved in some kind of selection process. Um, Elsa has a lot less to select from. It's not this multitude of images. There's a couple. Um, and it does make you think about photography. Maybe photography makes you think about photography, the processes by which um, it's made, uh, how photographs are taken. Um, I was fascinated for years, still am, with some of the famous photographs taken of Abraham Lincoln, very late in Lincoln's life. And I wonder, I look at these photographs, which are very familiar to all of us. All of us have seen them. Um, how much do I really know about Abraham Lincoln from looking at the photographs? I'm not sure, but I certainly know the face of Lincoln of what Lincoln looked like in the months just preceding his assassination. Um, so what is it that this photography does? I don't know. Does it activate our dreams, our memories? Um, is it a mnemonic device for becoming reconnected with the past? Don't know. Don't really know. Um, but I know she's right that photographs when people die take on a really deep meaning. When I look at her photograph of my mother, for example, I have all of these feelings of my gratitude to Elsa for having taken the photograph, congratulations to myself for dragging my mother into Elsa's studio to be photographed by Elsa my love of my mother. Um, and th in some sense, this moment, this strange moment in time, is preserved. Not quite an aspect, but preserved. Uh, Elsa's comment, I still think about it. She's a poet, among other things. Um, nailing down the now. That is really what the B-side is about more than anything, if I had to put my finger on it. Is this feeling that we're trapped in time and that everything is changing around us and everything will fade and eventually disappear. And what remains? this photographer's dream of nailing down the now. And as sh she describes it, this awareness that there is no nailing down the now because the now keeps moving ahead of us. Um, yes, I, and it's interesting because the, the detail we didn't notice when we took the picture, that becomes the significant thing that catches our eye in 10 or 20 years. Sure. Which is a fascinating uh, yeah. mystery about it that you cannot really judge a photo in a sense in the moment. You're tossing a net out and you're bringing in, you're trawling in mm. some sense. You're bringing in stuff that um, you're not really even aware of at the time. S something that people noticed very early on about photography. Um, there is 
Well, there's a whole number of films, but there's one film that immediately comes to mind called Northside 777 with James Stewart. And it's a plot, it's a miscarriage of justice story, but the plot revolves um, around a photograph that's taken that inadvertently wasn't the intention of photographer to capture this, but captures a piece of evidence that leads to this man being set free, released from prison. Um, it, it's that combination of intention and inadvertence, too, that is kind of an amazing thing. So go figure. Mm -hmm. Daryl Morris, thank you so much. Thank you. I hope this great is pleasure. interesting. Oh, fascinating for yeah. me. Um, really a great pleasure and an honor. So thank well, you. Oh, well, thank you.